I hope you all had a good Valentine's Day um, this past weekend. Um, I became engaged to the man I married on a Valentine's Day when the Berlin Wall was still standing. So around Valentine's Day, I tend to get very introspective and I mull over profound questions like, what the hell were we thinking? How on earth have we managed to put up with each other for so long? And why has our marriage succeeded when so many fail? But I'm, just, I'm gonna talk about some of our anniversaries um, when we hit the quarter century mark together. So to celebrate our quarter century millstone, uh, I mean milestone, <laughs> of putting up with each other, we foisted our son, the little monster, off for a night onto my brother and his wife. The man I married, or Mim, Mim for, for short, for the man I married, we hadn't had a night together without our son in almost three years when we were visiting my in-laws in Ohio. They watched the little monster while Mim and I took an Ohio Turnpike scenic drive. The same scene for the entire length of Ohio. <laughs> a night in Toledo might not sound romantic, but Flint, Michigan would have been fine by us as long as there was a bar and a bed. On our 25th engagement anniversary, the man I married and I pulled out all the stops and were off to Snohomish, not far from where we lived and just a few miles away from my brother's house. My brother asked, don't you want to go farther than that? I assured him that the close proximity meant we would be nearby should an emergency arise with the little monster. But the truth is that we would be only six minutes between drop off and our motel room. <laughs> Specifically, Within 10 minutes of drop off, I would be in the motel room bathtub. I hadn't wanted a bed and breakfast. I would feel too self-conscious about the squeaking bed springs and moaning I hoped were in my immediate future. They were, but for different reasons than I'd envisioned. There was exactly one motel in the B&B world headquarters of Snohomish, which has more frou-frou per square inch than my 1980s wedding dress. The motel was a plain affair, but as we had made our last minute plans, as we always do these days, I honed in on one feature of the motel. One room was equipped with an indoor jet tub that seated six. <laughs> that would accommodate even my expanding derriere. D, Jennifer. <laughs> and unlike my tub, I was sure this bathtub would be clean. <laughs> We hit the tub in the middle of the afternoon, as soon as the motel allowed check-in before unpacking. I brought along our premium bottle of whiskey, but forgot bubble bath. No problem, Mim said as he stepped into the tub with me, dumping in the entire sampler bottle of shampoo. <laughs> we clutched plastic motel room cups of our top shelf liquor. The water filled, the soap sort of foamed, and that was it. I hit switches, but nothing happened. No massaging blast from those little holes around the tub. I spied another switch on the wall across the room. I hauled myself out of the deep tub and up over the side onto the slick floor. Seriously not sexy to crack my head open on the tiles. I skated my way over and hit the switch. The underwater jets erupted on. Mim sighed, you did it. Whoever designed this arrangement must laugh every time he thinks of the practical joke he played on tourists who couldn't care less about water shortages plaguing most of the planet, his long-lasting jab at lovebirds who dared luxuriate in enough water for a farm family of old plus their cow. I climbed back into the tub, but something still wasn't right. The water was up past our shoulders and the jets blasted, but no bubbles. Well, it was shampoo, so what did I expect? Still, never one to leave things be, I fiddled. I twisted something or other that I couldn't see. This had the immediate effect of letting in air. All they do is let in some air, the reasonable protagonist says to the woman he's pressuring into an abortion in Hemingway's Hills Like White Elephants, taught in every short story class I've ever taken. All I did was let in some air. I aborted the calm, relaxing bath. Air plus water plus suave equals bubbles. Lots of bubbles. <laughs> The bubbles climbed. The bubbles rose higher, up past our shoulders, to our ears, over our heads, 
Leviathan bubbles rose up from the hot roiling sea. Mim and I could no longer see each other across the tub. <laughs> the foam kept expanding and crept over the side of the tub. We blew out puffs of air to clear breathing tunnels for ourselves in the solid wall of bubbles. The bubbles started to drink our whiskey. At first it was funny, but then I started to claustrophobically freak out. The bubbles kept climbing in a Snohomish version of The Shining. You might think that bubbles are silent. What could be more quiet than a bubble? But put a tower of bubbles together in a room and they party hardy. The bubbles put their hands together for a cacophony, a symphony, a Keith Moon jam session. Bubble hooves galloped around us. Add the noise to the claustrophobia and I had to end this calm, relaxing bath before I had a heart attack. <coughs> Found like Jim Morrison, dead in the bathtub. Only this was a marshy part of Washington State. Dying in a bathtub is only sexy if it's a clawfoot tub in Paris and you once looked great in leather pants. <laughs> I brailed my way around in the tub, seeking the oxygen release thingy and twisted, cutting off the air supply to the Godzilla of bubbles. The bubbles choked and wheezed out final breaths. The tower began to subside, collapsing down on itself. We batted them down, and soon I caught a glimpse of Mim's beloved mop of hair, which had done little deflating over a quarter century. We sported bubble beards. We laughed, we cackled, we hooted and hollered. After 25 years, we still had firsts, though we would never would have guessed that taking a wild bubble bath together would be one of them. We got dressed and walked across the street to a nice restaurant. Without the little monster in tow, we chose to sit at the bar. Since becoming parents, sitting up at the bar when at all possible on bar stools is our lodestar. Should I get another martini? I asked the man I married after the first went down easily and quickly. I shouldn't get another martini. That was a really big martini. Well, okay, I'm not driving. I signaled the bartender. We drank alone at the bar. What did we have left to say after almost 26 years of breathing the same air? Meanwhile, the bar behind us grew loud and boisterous, with a row of tables shoved together and a huge group of people crowded together in a tight circle around it. I felt alone despite my life's partner at the bar with me. We had once traveled 10,000 miles by motorcycle, with Mim finding lame excuses to talk to every local we encountered. But since becoming parents, we rarely left the house to even see friends. Most of the time, all I desired was silence. Despite my reading what to expect when you're expecting to foster adopt a six-year-old with anger management issues, the isolation of parenting the little monster had been unexpected. Mim and I, had Mim and I become one of those couples who no longer had anything to talk about except whether the little monster might be expelled again? <laughs> I left my bar stool and sidled over to the woman closest to me in the rowdy group. I greeted her and asked, what's the occasion? I wondered who I'd be wishing happy birthday or congratulations to and sharing news of my monumental anniversary. I was feeling magnanimous enough to send over a drink, which I'd never done in my life. It was a good day for first. Maybe they'd invite us over. Maybe my husband and I didn't want to be alone together after all. Our friend died, she said. It's a wake. <laughs> I slunk back to my stool and ordered the breaded oysters which I spent the rest of the night and the following morning throwing up. <laughs> it was that last martini, Mim pointed out, as I climbed back into our king-size bed in the wee hours after yet again being sick, in his highly honed marital version of soothing pity. It was the oysters, I moaned back. But you told me you really shouldn't order that last martini. You said I really shouldn't tee. He did it his best high-pitched drunk wife imitation. <laughs> right before you crashed that funeral. <laughs> thank you. So thank you, Katie and Susan and Harold and Hawaii um, for inviting me to be here. And for also, I don't know if you were in on this, Susan, but Katie said it would be okay if I had this as my book release party. So you knew about that. So this is the first time that I get to actually read from my new chapbook. I'm very excited. Thank you. Thank you. 
And thanks to those of you who came specifically for the book release party. It is right here. I won't actually be reading from it. I'm going to be reading from this, which my son is Drew Dragon's on. Um, and so my oldest son said perhaps it's more of a book report than a book release party, because I'm not reading from the book. But um, And thank you to Erica Grim Vance, the encaustic artist who did um, the cover art, this is actually called Liminal Sternum, and it's gorgeous, so you get a chance to look at it. Um, and thanks to Poets and Writers, who sponsored this event. So, yeah. Um, by way of introduction, I thought I'd tell you a little bit of where I come from, a little bit of my mother's, my mother's mother's, um, and something of who I am as well. So this first one's called Borderlands. My people live where the veil between living and dying is thin and moves with the slightest breath. Our feet are coarse with weather and miles and below in the bowls of our bellies, we carry our grief, our joy in songs that sway our sex. Our mouths we line with laughter. Look, our eyes are full with lessons. The waters are origins. My people live where we cannot stay. So this is gonna be quite a bumping into each other between Jennifer and I. <laughs> Because my work tends to read about like that. Um, <laughs> not a, I always wanted to be funny, you know? And, uh, so abundance and destitution is where I go next. <laughs> Christian Wyman, the poet, says, these are the two facets of the one face of God. And try as I might, I can't seem to pull one from the other. Abundance and destitution. So this next one is called When I Go. My disrepair is my comfort, like the sheet of dust on the kitchen's forever bunched rug. The oven only half works. It's time to move, but after the rain, the lightning outside, it crashes three miles off. I should have left when I saw the storm roll in. We all know the signs. First, it's the leaves, how their stillness turns to show their underbellies. Then the sky curtains, stage left to stage right. Before the sun lets go its light, green and yellow have never been more so. So I learned by going where I have to go. That's something Rick, he said. Um, and nothing more need be said about that, but I'll say it anyway. I learn uh, by going where I have to go, even into those formidable places, because that's where I find life. This I know to be true. That at that time, she saw something ancient move through the trees, bend their slender, light hungry crowns with such force they shook as they kissed and returned. That at that time she heard their song as if the sea ascended into cloud and crashed memory through their leaves, turning each a wreck of rolling into sky. At that time she spoke beauty and new rage. Um, so this one ends with bioluminescent fungi, <laughs> which is really fun. It's a uh, foxfire, which, um, the t as the tall tale goes, lives in um, a place in Ohio where my dad grew up. And the name of this poem is called Ohio, and it's where I was born. Bioluminescent fungi. Practicing words with liquid letters his mouth a cave where a single bat sleeps and wakes to find 
the boulder. To earn his way out, he speaks a riddle, a spell cast train, a dragon, a steam engine, a mouth of smoke. Reaching from dream, grandfather cups a ball behind his crooked back, his nails soft and bend on the curve of hide, pitch, and catch. A caw wakes the boy under damp sheets, musk, before rain falls the patter of naked feet. Grandfather's cold on his shoulder. Finding the boat he toes in, squints shore light into fox fire, into the sway of lanterns after the trumpet of treed raccoons. My, my poetry is funny only because it's so bad. So, uh, so, so my husband and I got engaged on Valentine's Day and we got married like four months after that. We hadn't even known each other for a year, um, but it wasn't a shotgun wedding. I like to call it a Nerf gun wedding. <laughs> so four months after our 25th engagement anniversary in Snohomish, we took an another romantic trip together. For our 25th wedding anniversary, we drove a full hour and a half to yet another bathtub, this time on Kameno Island. I bought an economy-sized jug of bubble bath, which I remembered to bring with me, but the man I married forgot all of his luggage, including his allergy and heartburn medications. <laughs> this time, it was Mim who lay moaning on the bed for the entire duration of the trip. The bed under a mirrored ceiling, which is so wrong for people who've been married for 25 years, <laughs> and they don't need to know this late in the game, that's what they've looked like all this time. <laughs> the bed next to the giant jet tub. This fine establishment had gotten it right. No slithering from an arousing bath out to the bedroom. We could take one step from our jacuzzi of love to the mattress. Except this time, I was in the bathtub alone while Mim hugged a box of Kleenex on the bed. But I got smart this time. I spied the jet tub switch across the room. What's with the universal design flaw? I flipped it on before climbing into the tub as it filled, thinking, I am one sharp cookie. As the tub filled, the jets I had so cleverly turned on in advance made contact with the surface of the rising water which sent sudden powerful jets of hot water whooshing across the tub and onto the bed and onto Mim. <laughs> it was as if I turned on a few fire hoses at full blast. <laughs> Mim rose up from the bed with a startled roar like a hoary beowulf battling back serpents of water that continued to arc across the room. Because the water was now spewing across the room, the hot tub was no longer filling, which would eventually have submerged the jet blasts. I turned off the water and heaved myself out of the tub, grappling my soggy way across the carpeted room to hit the switch. I turned sheepishly to face Mim, who sat dripping into a puddle on the comforter. This is your side of the bed tonight, he told me. <laughs> Cartography. From childhood, we construct a map of our physical world. The sky is blue, clouds are white, our home a stone square. We draw ourselves as lines near rippled water. These are the swallows that dart from holes in the cliffs, small arrows along the teeth of the lake. It's headwaters, a muddy belly that pulls at our feet when we stop. Overhead, yellow circle, round sun. Even now, the Missouri, its dark flooding, threatens our footing. So in, in childhood, there's shape and order to things, and that quickly gives way. Um, <laughs> But one of those containers is forgiveness. I believe we're born with this gorgeous, huge container um, called forgiveness, and then we lose that along the way 
until we're reminded again. Um, so this is called Weather. That day it rained in the room, I couldn't see you. All those clouds in my face, I couldn't breathe. Only now can I wonder, what did you see? You clung to my legs, you said, Mama, close your eyes, they scare me. You said, Mama, outside, and you put your weight into me. You already knew, when my feet find a place to plant, I see you. You run into grass, that green smell of living and everything I need. You remember the worm house? A paper cup. We fished worms out of puddles. The soft brown needles a bed. You said, Mama, look. And brought your worms home, tucked under dandelion leaves. They like rain, you said. They come out when it's raining. So this next one is called uh, Sila, and it's actually a word that comes from the Psalms, and it means stop and consider. I like to translate it to stop and stare. <laughs> Sila. In the yard of owl and mouse, broken star and bangle, near dreams speak in tongues making a thing like water turn open in ropes of velvet. The gray mouse scratching shale beneath the window, the length of sound and what blooms at night, jasmine along the quiet vine of morning glories. The low hum of train against track, a whistle that separates dark from sleep. As the moth flies into the window, its body opening again and again against the glass, snapping ancient wings toward dust and spark, asking the world to be a moment both different and still. Yeah. So this one goes out to my husband who's wrangling my daughter in the next room. Um, there's all this beauty, someone will say, as if the words could make it more true. That was from an old poem I wrote um, in my grad program at UW. And it was written after a hike I had taken with Paul. Um, and it was right at dusk, that glowy time where everything just glows and looks magical. It was beautiful. And he said, there's all this beauty. And I just wanted to punch him. I was so frustrated because there was just no way I could take more of it into me and try as I might to wrangle, to lasso this beauty with words and draw it into me, it was impossible. So um, my book is titled, The Words Could Not Make It, Words Could Not Make It More True. Um, and it's something like that. So here's the title poem of the book, Words Could Not Make It More True. We map the globe you've made of my belly the fullness of my breasts, the eagerness you've grown in my core. And here, where we love and eat and sleep and fight, here you descend. And every song you've ever sung unravels rib by rib, unravels gratitude and terror and mercy. And I breathe a windstorm. I breathe a whisper and open. I arch like a cat, fold like a child and open to be torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shakes, the rocks are split. The ocean is upon us and you crown my fingers on your skin and bone of my bone, you are flesh. And for my last little piece, um, Katie had referred in some of her materials to the secret sauce of marriage, and so I'm going to wrap it up with the secret sauce of marriage. <laughs> so uh, continuing the saga, uh, my parents had cashed in miles to fly first class to Seattle 
so they could drink heavily in flight to mentally prepare for babysitting our son, the little monster, <laughs> while the man I married and I took that two-night vacation to commemorate a quarter century of wedded, what I call blisters. <laughs> you know the tables have turned when your parents are now spending the night in your bed. I had pestered Mim with ideas for celebrating a mind-boggling number of years spent tolerating each other. But despite my printing out his passport renewal form two years prior, Mim still had not knuckled under to the trauma of a passport photo, which makes comparisons to your expired passport photo and younger self hard to ignore. The silvery bush on his face and his extravagant head of hair, which hasn't diminished over the years, might not fit in a small passport photo. His mugshot would require a sandwich board. I, however, had renewed my passport, both my chins fit in the photo, <laughs> which led me to consider taking separate silver anniversary vacations. But since separate trips would be twice as expensive, we decided to go domestic together and bond, a rare opportunity since the little monster entered our lives. Going away for two whole nights meant going whole hog. We considered getting hitched in Vegas, again, but we still weren't quite sure we'd made the right decision to tie the knot back in 88, and repeating our vows would require making up our, our minds about matrimony once and for all, and we weren't sure we were ready for that level of commitment. <laughs> so we drove, we uh, shelved that idea and drove the hour and a half to Camino Island. There we were, trying to get away from it all, stuck on an island, trying to figure out what the heck to do with each other, when we ran into our neighbor who was there with a squad of families from our local elementary school. <laughs> you know, the same darn thing happened 25 years ago when we moved to Ballard with the ink still wet on our marriage certificate. We were so hip that we paved the way for the hipsters two decades later. Back then, we could not find a margarita after 10 on a Saturday night in Ballard. Now, the same can be said of a parking space at any time of day. <laughs> So we didn't want to drive up the real estate prices on Camino when news of our presence leaked. So we returned to Ballard, where some longtime establishments contribute, contributed to our marriage's longevity. As newlyweds, we arrived the same year that Robertino's Cafe opened. It was one of the first and only espresso cafes in Seattle, and was also the only place that sold Nutella, the Italian hazelnut chocolate spread, now as ubiquitous as espresso. Alfonso, the Italian owner of Robertino's, pulled aside the very young man I had just recently married and instructed him on what Italian men do with Nutella to keep their wives very happy. <laughs> I cannot divulge the secret in a public place. <laughs> I won't tell you whether or not Mim followed the advice, but perhaps it's no coincidence that Robertino's is still in business and so are Mim and I. <laughs> so this, this next poem works with the idea of beach glass. Um, the transformation of broken things. Our grief is a similar process and similarly fathomless. This is called grief. The sea isn't done with you. Tossed and split and thrown under, now you'll know tenacity. The water that works you over is not coincidence. The wall of tide and rock has always been bigger than you. The gulls cry your turning. So one of my um, favorite writers is David James Duncan. And I recently read um, an uh, essay he wrote in The Sun. This is a quote I just wanted to share with you uh, by David James Duncan. It's an odd catch 22. If we feel the unspeakable, and then try to speak of what we felt, we sound like fools. But if we feel the unspeakable and don't speak, we feel like ingrates. I'm inclined toward gratitude, so foolishly I speak. 
And that, that has meant a lot to me. Um, this is my last poem, by the way. Thank you again for being here. Um, my kids have been troopers. Thank you. And they'll be leaving at break. Um, so this is my goodbye to you as well. But there's something about gratitude. Uh, I find whenever I'm, uh, and I'm stuck in my own mire, my own stuff, the gratitude has this way of lifting me out of it. So this next poem, my last poem, is called Antiphon for Joseph. And Antiphon is a verse sung in response. And my two homes are Nebraska and Seattle, Lincoln, Nebraska, Seattle, Washington. And they both show up here. It's crazy how it worked out. The sky is flush with blue and below blue, the rolling waves of the Puget Sound. Spread these waves flat. Watch them roll in yellows and browns of boot tongue, leather, clay. See the plains of Nebraska, how they stretch beneath spider lightning, hold flood water, teach order, teach how much we can carry before weary we lie down. Snow came early once, before our trees lost their leaves. A neighborhood of trees, a city of trees fell. And thirsty, we walked through them. Power lines and snow sounds, weight and glare, where we risked to touch the weather. Under the snow, our bodies folded into each other promises. The open sky, the open field, see the wind still drives the grasses. Connect them blue and watch the gull dive. Now at low tide, we touch limpet, the rough key hole, its open apex, the thin Pacific plate, each returning to its rock, its home scar. We brush fingertips across anemones, moon glow, stubby rose, their tentacles, sticky rough, pull our fingers, fingers toward their single openings and close. We hazard the sting of stranded jellies, push them across painted rocks, the gull-stitched shore, draw windows in the sand. The water answers, a sunflower star with 24 arms, its soft skin, the squid, its liminal eye, its body an arrow. To think, it was all water once. The land given as threshold, horizon, everywhere incarnate. Tonight we're really happy to have Allison Kennedy, who is a massage therapist at M3 Body Works here in Seattle. And to quote one of Allison's patients, Allison has a gentle yet reassuring presence. She knows how to listen to the people who come to her for help and provide just what they need. Here's Allison Kennedy, and she'll be letting you know what her poem is and what it's about and why she chose it. Here's Allison. Thank you. Um, so I chose a poem by Sharon Olds from The Unswept Room. It's called Herbal Wrath. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, I thought it was really funny because I chose this poem today because I wanted a, a poem that evoked the image of my husband. And, um, and it really <laughs> works well with um, <laughs> the readings that have been done already. So here it is, Herbal Wrath. When they covered me with sheets just boiled in sage and tucked me in a lead-lined blanket, I felt afraid. And to steady myself, I thought of my husband. And his face seemed like a mule deer's face, the eyes far apart and mild, the expression languageless, maybe almost conceptless, may, uh, as if morals are not needed here. He looks in a state of natural goodness. And then I thought 
His face is more like an Indian moon moth, the gray-green markings of his eyes. And then, almost unconscious in the spirit of boiled sage, I thought his face is like an ivory violet with gray-green stains, or like granite streaked with quartz porphyry. Maybe I did not want a human. Maybe after my father and mother, I wanted another species. I wanted to sink down, animal, vegetable, mineral. I don't sense in him the will to change me or dislike me. He seems like a bed of heal-all. I lie down in him and sleep or not sleep. And no touch is the same with him as any touch has been. And I feel at home in him and of him, as if by now I am part of him. I've seen bumblebees like parts of blossoms as they were browsing, legs dangling. I've seen babies carried on the hip, asleep, full pitchers carried by shepherds in the desert, full pitchers of stars carried across the skies or visions of them, ideal stars, ideal skies.